Welcome everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, today we begin our first panel from our Slate School Idea Lab. So welcome to Slate School here in North Haven, Connecticut. Uh, Slate School is committed to excellence in education. We are delighted to present the Education Idea Lab, which is a new, unique virtual series that is free and open to the public. This thought leading event convenes leaders, change makers, and participants from all sectors of education and innovation. Thank you for joining us. We're thrilled to have all of you with us here today. My name is Julie Mountcastle, and I am head of school at Slate School. I'll briefly introduce you to Slate School, review the webinar logistics, and then we'll hear from our five amazing expert panelists. So Slate School is an independent 501c3 nonprofit elementary school where education is focused on cultivating creativity, fostering ingenuity, and inspiring a deep passion for lifelong learning. At Slate School, we have formed a community that is constantly striving to improve practice, to create meaningful educational experiences for all learners of all ages, and to change the landscape in education. Slate School convenes experts for important, authentic conversations about education, and these online dialogues, like today's, are free and open to the public. We're so delighted to have all of you with us today. We have learners joining us from six continents. Now I'll describe the basic logistics of the webinar. We have five amazing panelists, and they have a wealth of experience to share with you during this next hour. Each of our panelists today will give a two minute introduction about themselves and their current role, their key guidance and advice about embracing challenges in their careers as opportunities to grow. We'll then proceed with the panel discussion. We invite you to submit additional questions as comments on Facebook, and we will select some of those questions to ask our panelists today as well. So we'll proceed with having our panelists introduce themselves in alphabetical order. I'm delighted to introduce you to our first panelist, Rebecca Harden. Please introduce yourself, give us your background, your current role, and please share your guidance and advice about embracing challenges in careers as opportunities to grow. Well, thank you very much, Julie. And it's wonderful to be here with you all and on Facebook this morning. I am, as you said, Rebecca Hardin. I'm an associate professor at the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability, which makes me a really avid partner in thinking about nature-based learning with the remarkable staff at Slate School who are pioneering in these directions with so much of what they do, <clears throat> both in the classroom and beyond. For our parts at a professional school like ours, where we do a lot of education of master's students and undergraduates, we are also constantly striving to connect curricular and co-curricular learning, immersive experiential learning about the natural world and in the natural world to what we do online and in our publications and research efforts. In that respect, I currently direct collaborations for an open source, open access platform that's taking case-based learning for professionals of the kind you might do in business school or law school or medical school and applying it to environmental and sustainability spaces. I'll be talking more about that today, but what I can say now is that it combines long-standing interests of mine since my own elementary and high school days in digital media and communication with the advances in science and sustainability science. It's a very gratifying role for me to be playing. Um, and it's one that links what we do at university levels with much different levels of learning from elementary and secondary through lifelong learning and professional development. We are really interested in creating responsive, adaptive tools that have low barriers to use and can revolutionize how humans think and organize together to solve environmental challenges of our time. Um, I think that kind of collaborative work, the ways that we can use technology to improve and increase our face-to-face -face connections for learning and our team building is really what I find um, challenging and delightful. My advice would be to, um, to think about what technology tools offer you in real lived relationships for problem-driven education and curiosity-driven education. I know we'll talk more about that soon. Awesome. Thank you, Rebecca. And now if we could uh, hear from Laura McBain. Welcome, Laura. 
Thank you so much for having me. Good morning from the West Coast. Um, and it's early here and just welcome to everyone that's watching here today on Facebook Live and excited to see questions as they come up. Um, I am, my name is Laura McBain. I am the co-director of the K-12 lab at the Stanford D School. And my job is to help teachers um, think about becoming designers. Um, I train educators in design thinking. I teach Stanford classes, which I'm doing right now online, like many of y'all. Um, and I also work on experiments in education, how we can use design thinking and the processes of design to really create some more equitable opportunities for young people um, and for educators within education. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about what are the questions that don't get answered? Um, and I would say right now, I think many of us um, are in a massive experiment in education. Um, and there is no greater time to think about how we understand our students' experience, uh, which is the design process, how we connect with the others, and how we support families. And so we are in the midst at the D School thinking about those exact questions. We use the process of learning from people, prototyping, um, ideation and testing constantly to think about how do we improve not only the learning of our students but their lived experience. Um, like many of you all, we think that learning is, is an evocative experience, right? It means getting outside, it means doing proper need finding and discovering what's really not being solved. And so I think this first question about opportunities is the design process, right? Seeing things that are potentially challenges and pivoting them into ways in which we can all grow and learn and really be um, forward thinkers. And I would also say really contributors to the broader uh, ecosystem. So thank you for having me. Oh, our pleasure. Amazing. Uh, and now just introduce you to Tom Shepard. Tom, tell us about yourself a little bit. Thanks, Julie. Uh, my name is Tom Shepard. I'm the head of school at St. Andrews Episcopal School in Ridgeland in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, we're a pre-K to 12 school of 1,100 amazing kids. Uh, and in this time, uh, you know, this crisis, if you will, it's actually, to me, filled with opportunities as we uh, imagine how our students learn, how we push forward, and most importantly of all, I think, how the world of independent schools and all schools can evolve quickly uh, in a way that helps students, helps parents, and helps schools. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, I think, about our school motto is, we'll find a way or make one. And in this time, that's no more true than I've ever seen. The, the ideas that are coming out right now, uh, many of which may never see the light of day, but the possibilities we're encountering in the independent school world, as you talk to the thought leaders uh, and the ways they are considering how we can push forward, this will be, in the end, uh, the greatest challenge we've ever faced but also one of the greatest things that could have ever happened to schools as it accelerates the pace of change. So as we work through it, uh, I'm optimistic about where we're headed and where we might get to. Great. Boy, optimism is sometimes in short supply, but not with you, Tom. That was great, thanks. Um, and now uh, we'll hear from Laura Thomas. Hi, Laura. That double Laura's. Yeah. I, I don't think I've ever been in a meeting that didn't have at least two Lauras, actually. Um, so, hi, um, I'm Laura Thomas. I am um, a faculty member at Antioch University, New England, which is one of the five campuses of the Antioch University system. Um, I am the director of our Experienced Educators Program, and I'm also a library media specialist one day a week, and I'm a community facilitator blogger and community edi or contributing editor for Edutopia as well. Um, my work at Antioch um, really has set me up nicely for this conversation. Our uh, university motto um, comes from the words of Horace Mann, who was one of our first administrators, who said, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. Um, and so that really drives our work. My specific victory for humanity is around helping people understand change and how it is a predictable, um, natural process and how you can move through it in a way that's reflective and supportive and um, which builds, builds community instead of uh, tears community down. Um, and so that's really been my work at Antioch for almost 20 years. Great, wonderful. 
Well, thank you all for joining us. I'm, I'm extraordinarily um, excited to, to chat with you. Um, I just begin with a question for, for, um, for Laura Thomas. Um, just, I know, uh, you know, life takes us in strange places. And when you think of your, your journey as, as an educator and as a, as a learner, really, even, I think there, there were probably some specific inflection points. And I'm just wondering if you can, you know, think back a little bit and describe one or two of those points and, and maybe, you know, what you learned at the time. Um, I'd be happy to do that, but do we want Julie to introduce herself first? Oh, I see. Juliet is here. That's awesome. Juliet, uh, welcome. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Um, yes, I've been keeping quite quiet, but you can see me. Oh, wonderful. Yes, now we can. Fantastic. Yes, we can. That's great. Brilliant. All right. Well, um, hello, everyone. Um, greetings from Scotland. I am based um, just north of Aberdeen. Um, at 57 degrees north, but thanks to the warm Atlantic drift, um, it's not as cold as it sounds latitudinally. Um, my career um, involves having been a school principal, um, but 13 years ago, I stopped um, not through choice, but through work-related stress and not knowing what to do. Um, I set out to have to completely rethink my life and I went back to my love and passion, which is learning and teaching outdoors. And that's what I do as a consultant um, who runs a not-for-profit um, type of business. Um, it's not got that strict. I'm not a charity. Um, I'm still a business through and through, but um, I don't aim to make much money. Um, and yes, so my current projects are all about changing hearts and minds because we have been conditioned within our education system to think indoors. We are told really that real learning happens indoors and that anything else is a bit more jazz hands and maybe lacks the um, validity of what we would call traditional scholarship. Um, so my aim is to change all that within Scotland and beyond. So um, at the moment, my three main projects are um, working with Scottish Forestry, one of the government agencies, um, to help um, ensure that our first national qualification for forest kindergarten is um, available and um, students who wish to become preschool teachers and educators are able to get that as part of their training. I am working with Dundee City Council, um, working mainly with grades four to six, um, doing an outdoor numeracy project. And in particular, saying how can numeracy, when it's taught outside, raise attainment, especially for those who are harder to engage both with maths and academia in, in general. And then finally, I have a very creative project with um, Aberdeen City's preschools. Um, it's a partnership one with the preschool team, with the Countryside Ranger. We are just looking at how do we improve outdoor learning and most importantly, how do we empower the education staff to do that? Um, and there's lots of things happening there. And, and when I was asked to think about challenges, I always say um, challenges are like trying to open a sealed piggy bank. You know, you want to get the money out, but in a way that doesn't damage the pig. Um, so I, I think always that there's always that sort of, um, you know, conundrum that we've got. We don't want to damage the pig when we when we in, engage in change. Yeah. Yeah, but sometimes you have to break the pig and it's better to break the pig. <laughs> Um, so uh, I'm so glad you're here, Juliet. I didn't know that you were on board. I'm so happy to see your face and to hear your wonderful words of wisdom. It's fantastic. As you can see, we have a great panel here. So I'm going to kind of shift back now, pivot back to Laura. So Laura, just thinking about that question, um, I, I, I received it from so many people for you. So I, I, I want to kind of share it with you and see if you can talk a little bit about those and I'm going to now forever call them piggyback, piggy bank <laughs> moments. If you can look back to a piggy bank moment and sort of see, um, you know, what, what you learned from, from a couple yeah. of those times. Well, so there were, there were two. Um, the first was when I was um, a beginning teacher 
and I lucked into um, a teaching job in a school that um, in Missouri actually that had received a large five-year grant five years five million dollars um, to do a lot of work it was a high school um, and it was a school that had not been wildly successful they were sort of a typical comprehensive high school um, and we received these funds to do some big explore, explorative work and so for five years we had unlimited professional development funds, sort of carte blanche to experiment, um, to figure out how things would work for us. And I had the opportunity to learn so much. I got involved with the Coalition of Essential Schools, which unfortunately no longer exists, but which provided so many amazing opportunities. And um, what I learned through those years was, you know, no matter what tool I was trying to use because we had literally, I mean, this was when the internet was new, so I'm dating myself, <laughs> but we actually had computers that connected to the internet at school, which was unheard of at that point. That was back when America Online was like, that was the brand new technology that everybody was excited about. Some, I, there are probably people on Facebook who don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but, um, there, and so we, had all these great tools that we could use and it was literally anything you wanted to try within reason and no matter what tool i was using it always came down to the quality of my relationships with my kids um, how well i knew them how much i respected them how much i respected their families we had a very diverse community um, and it, it didn't matter what the tool was it mattered that the kids knew that i liked them and that I took the time to build a relationship in each class. We were doing four by four block scheduling, which was brand new then. So I had four classes at a time for six weeks, and then we would turn over to another set. Um, and each block was 90 minutes. And um, so over and over again, I would get to know these new sets of kids. And then, you know, building class norms together was considered unusual. Um, but we did it every six weeks with a new set of kids four blocks a day, we build our norms. And um, it, it taught me a ton. It also taught me how important it was to have powerful relationships with my colleagues, not just professional, not just collegial or collaborative relationships, but also relationships where we could fail in front of each other. Uh, this was when critical friends groups were new and sort of innovative. And now, you know, we have PLCs everywhere. Um, but at that time, this was a new idea. And I remember being in a meeting, one of the first groups with my principal and just explaining how I had fallen flat. I had tried something and it was a disaster. And I was talking to another colleague in another school later and she couldn't believe that I had let my principal know how badly I had failed because I wasn't tenured. I was an at-will employee at that point. And she said, well, you're gonna get fired. And I said, I don't think Mike's gonna fire me. He actually had some great ideas, some great suggestions. Um, and I learned the power of vulnerability and also what it is to be a really good leader who has built a community where teachers feel like they can fail publicly. Um, and that ultimately led me to Antioch because I, you know, I looked at some other work and I did worked in some other schools later and um, didn't ever feel that sense of safety until I landed in my grad program at Antioch and suddenly it was like I was home and I had colleagues that I could speak with about failures and about trying new things and um, you know what was the, what were our growing edges and how were we working with them and, um, and and it just reiterated for me that no matter what you're trying to do always 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 it comes back to relationships and vulnerability and taking care of one another um, and respecting our experiences and our contexts so that um, we can all sort of evolve our own versions of what the tools are. I'm really leery of anything that says it's plug and play. You know, you learn how to do this thing and then you do it in class and it'll always work. <laughs> I much prefer places that say, like we always say at Antioch, you know, take what you can use, um, put aside the stuff that doesn't feel useful right now, don't throw it away, but put it aside because a year from now it may make sense. It might be the right tool at that point or five years from now or 20 years from now, you may suddenly go, oh my gosh, that's what they meant by that. I can totally use that now. Where if you tried to use it at a different point, it wouldn't have been the right tool for the job. Yeah. So I think those are probably the most important um, inflection points for me as an educator, which really only come down to one idea, which I could have said very quickly instead of very 
not quickly. <laughs> I thought that was great. I thought that was great. And it, and it, and it leads me actually, because I think, um, I think what you're describing are, are, are a whole lot of uh, big learning moments one after another, you know, um, moments that most, most people might say, oh boy, that was a, that was a, you, you called yourself, you know, you called it yourself a monumental flop, a failure, right? But um, I, I think for young educators, especially um, unable to look at sort of the long view, and I'm not saying that anyone here in this panel can actually see the long view because we're all still very young, but um, I'm just wondering maybe Laura, Laura McBain, maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how, how to help people to be a little bit less concerned about the failures, in, in fact, to kind of almost to embrace them, you know, as, in, as, as necessary moves yeah. throughout the journey. Maybe you could talk to that a little bit. Um, I love Laura's. We come from a similar, we from a similar fabric of, of critical friends and coalition. So we, I feel like I have another conversation with you later uh, about Ted Sizer and lots of roots of progressive ed. Um, and I think, you know, similar to you and I, if I had time, I would share a screen. I don't know if you can see. Uh, let's see if that will work. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I see that. Oh. That's a quick, I mean, I could do a share screen, but one of the things that we think about at the D school is the difference between the learning journey and the emotion. And I think that, you know, I think when we think about learning, um, there is this thing that like, oh, it has to feel good or you're on this quest of happiness. And I think that most of us in education know that um, productive struggle, as they like to call it, right, um, is part of the learning process. And I think what oftentimes, you know, in design, um, and myself as a teacher, and I was a principal, um, I hoped open a project-based school. Um, I gave up my tenure to become a project-based learning teacher. All these things where I really didn't know what I was doing and that I was destined to fail. Um, and I think, uh, and then I think part of that is embracing and knowing that and just acknowledging that you know that the first couple times you do something, you will not do it well. So I think there is a power of naming. I think oftentimes like naming that we right now are in the midst of some experiments that we're thinking about and we have named that 80% of the work that we're doing will not work. There is, and I think that many of us right now in this virtual environment, I, all of us that are teaching online and pivoting, we know that there are things right now that we would never want to do again. Um, there are moments of, of Zoomified meetings and things that we've learned from that we don't want to recreate. And so when we think about failure and learning, I think it's really important to like, one, we have to name that failure is the learning and we, it's productive struggle that is part of the learning process. And to say that you're gonna get it quickly or you're gonna get an A on it right away is really, I would say, um, undervaluing the learning process, right? To sit, failure is the learning process. Um, and I think all of us who've had lots of experiences in our life know that we learn so much more from our moments of struggle than we do from our, um, for our peaks, um, if you will. Uh, we often say in design, we like to use this massive peak squig moment and we think the moments where we are most struggling are probably our deepest moments of insight. Personally, I would say, and professionally, the moments where we have been frustrated, <laughs> tired, thinking, wow, what did I just do? Have been the moments of profound insight. Um, and I think many of us and anyone watching, I'm sure can think about moments in their life where they felt that it was not so great. Um, and I learned this thing. And I think the question I would ask as educators is how do we actually design for that? And how do we hold students up during those moments with supportive emotional su and social supports? We know that these moments will come. So where is the opportunities for students to connect about the failures they had? to highlight how they navigated through it, how they supported each other, and what insight they got from that. And I think when we're thinking about opportunities and failure, it's not just the moments, right? It's the reflection on those moments that lead to the insights. And so um, as designers, we often think that the insights is the nugget, it's the piggy bank, right? It's that $2 coin right inside there. It's that insight that we're trying to get to. And I would say, you know, for those of us watching now, we're in the midst of these massive learning moments. You know, every single person I imagine watching and in this call are prototyping, we're trying to find new ways to learn, we're thinking about 
How do we make our lessons shorter, more synchronous, getting our students outside where they can see where the learning is, where we have actually very little control over what actually happens in homes and what learning might be. And so I would say with respect to like all of us right now and those who are educating, we like to call them overnight educators. All of a sudden people who are no longer, we're not in the position of educating are now overnight educators and really embracing that this productive struggle is part of the process um, and really leaning into that and giving one, I think giving ourselves a break <laughs> that it's not gonna be perfect. Um, and I know for all those who've been in classrooms, all of us have been in classroom teachers, we know we've had great days, we've had bad days. And just honoring those moments, I think, is part of that lesson when we're thinking about failure as an opportunity. Um, and really leaning into like, what was that moment? What did I learn from it? And how do I navigate through? Um, it, to me, is part of that process. Yeah, that's great. I, as, you, as you were talking, I was thinking about the relationship we all have also with parents um, and how valuable and how incredible what an opportunity this is to talk with them about the, the, the moment of teaching, like being able to kind of capitalize on those opportunities that you see when, when you, your child or, or your student has just that moment of great wonder in their eyes and how um, thrilling it is and how sometimes even in that moment you feel that you don't connect as, as well as you could have. Oh, that could have been better, that could have been better. But then the conversation now among families and educators together because we're all doing it. And maybe we were all doing it all along, but maybe we didn't all realize we were all doing it all along, right? So our, our children's first teachers are now being re-empowered. And I think, um, I think it can only do good things, um, even though it's hard, uh, to move education along for all of us. It's so interesting to me because when I think about, um, when I, 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 was, I was thinking about you, Tom, and I was thinking about how I know that you've had different spots along the way you know, uh, along your journey. And I, I, I know it's a different world than, you know, I thought I was going to grow up into. I thought, you know, I'd probably get a job and, you know, try to get the gold watch at the end of the, you know, I'd stay there for my whole life and do one job. And it was going to be great. And I'd be all hunkered down and, and the world isn't like that. And um, I, I feel like there are some, some big events that happen that, you know, unconsciously change us. And, 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 and they, they provide themes of our lives that guide our paths in ways that we sometimes don't even notice. And I'm wondering what some of those things might be for you, Tom. What do, what do you think about that? Yeah, you know, I think that is so true. Uh, and especially, um, I'd say for young educators, uh, the more they can um, open themselves up to at least reflecting upon um, those themes, those moments, and when they occur, they may not even realize it, but you're right, they absolutely accumulate over time. Uh, and if over time we then become aware of how they impact us, they can shape our journey. I mean, if you had said to me when I was 21 years old, teaching in a history at a boarding school in Pennsylvania, uh, that I would uh, be 50 years old and the head of a pre-K to 12 school in Jackson, Mississippi, I would have thought, well, how is that journey gonna happen? And it only happens because over time, we realized things like um, I had opportunities in earlier points in my career to travel extensively internationally and appreciate all that I learned along the way. I had other opportunities where I realized I know nothing about computers, and yet I'm attracted to what a database might be able to do for me. Uh, or you realize, wow, I, I like being around people who are just downright really smart uh, because I learn a lot from them. And the more you open yourselves up to knowing those things, the more you are open to where the journey might lead. And I think about that in the context of what we're going through right now. Uh, there are young educators out there who are in a position to redefine uh, what teaching is all about in amazing ways. And their contributions um, are just extraordinary. I, we have a technology integrationist here at uh, St. Andrews, and uh, she's, she's just flat out very talented person. Uh, many people have worked hard, but what she has done during this time on our journey has just been phenomenal. And I think to myself, here's somebody who, because of this, is not just furthering their career, 
but literally launching it in all kinds of directions. Uh, you know, 20 years from now, where is she going to be? Uh, she'll be doing something amazing. And it's because of this. So if we can find those moments to say, why did that strike me? Why is that interesting to me? How did that impact me? And then over time, we take those themes and run with them. But then we also, at the same time, I think, have to look at the areas that, I don't know, not that we're not interested in them, but maybe they're not part of who we are and be willing to surround ourselves with others who fill in those spots and make up what is inevitably a great educational team. Wow, that's, I, that's, that's, that's so right. Um, I, I think um, it, it just makes me wonder about um, where, I'm, I'm thinking about you, Rebecca, and I'm just, I'm just wondering, I, I, I've learned so much from, from, from you. Um, and, you know, you, you have a huge, huge brain. Uh, but uh, but I, also, I often wonder who, who are the people that, that you have watched? Who are the people that um, have been role models for you that, have, that you've learned the most from? Gosh, Julie, I, I mean, you're one of them now, so heads up. <laughs> Uh -huh. Um, but I, and, and, and I, and there are like, you know, four or five more on, on this panel today. One of the things I love about the way Slate builds is through dialogue and sharing and education. I mean, certainly Jennifer Staple herself was a student of mine, um, who shaped me. We've learned enormous amounts from each other, even when we were teacher and student. And she was, um, a quiet, shy sophomore in my advanced graduate seminar asking permission to take that seminar in her thick glasses, <laughs> thinking about anthropologies of sight and vision and working to help herself understand how her impaired vision could be a resource for her in creating new ways of um, bridging global healthcare deliveries for sight and vision, and also thinking about bridging you know, educational gaps on these kinds of questions about global health and access to care. So watching her and helping her as an educator, right, to, to lift her projects off the ground was an enormous inspiration to me. And at the same time, I was looking around me in the Yale landscape at my senior colleagues for inspiration. And I have to say one who um, was, it, it, now, it now strikes me, I can now say this because I, I am old enough to have that long view you're talking about, although of course we're all very young, but um, I'm right at that. I, I will say that Professor James C. Scott, Jim Scott, um, who's a political scientist who taught for years at, at Yale, um, he built a community there called the Agrarian Studies Program. And it was a community that was doing something that, you know, the Ivory Tower and the Ivy League didn't often do, which was to think about farming <laughs> and food production, not like a land grant university would with like extension and outreach and improved technologies, but like what's the identity and the history of farming in different parts of the world? What does it have to do with how people, all kinds of people get their food and relate to landscapes, even their own lawns? He made a seminar within that New Haven landscape where people came from Quinnipiac College, they came from farms, they came from divinity schools, they came, many people who weren't even academics would attend those seminars on Fridays and share their ideas because it was a permissive, open, non-normative space where learning could be a community endeavor and it could be generous, but also hard hitting and, and critical. And I think, you know, watching the ways that uh, James Scott, when he moved from the University of Wisconsin, from the public education system to Yale, he brought a kind of grounded um, attention to peasants and farm, you know, he brought that with him and he built it out in a way that became prestigious and it became a beacon throughout the country. In top journals, he kind of helped create a field of new kinds of social history that wasn't about kings and queens and great you know, diplomatic negotiations, but about who was working the land, how and when. And he leveraged international connections in doing it. And I'm watching him above me and Jennifer coming up through my classrooms, I realized that there are always in every generation, those educators some of us are talking about here who can take resources and turn them into opportunities for thinking in new ways and learning in new ways. We've never needed that more than today. I am sitting here at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and our motto remains, 
you know, an uncommon education for the common man. And I think, you know, we can talk a little more as the hour unfolds about what that mandate means to me now, but it's, it's one I carry with enormous um, gratitude and humility because I've seen so many people around me, students and teachers of mine, who've managed to make that their lives work in such creative ways. Beautiful. I couldn't, have, I couldn't have asked for a better answer to that question. Holy cow, that's amazing. Um, so, Juliet, I'm just thinking about what Rebecca said in describing, she, she describes Jennifer Staple Clark, who's, who's the founder of Slate School, by the way. And she is a remarkable human being by any account. Um, but you began, actually, Rebecca, by talking about what was actually a personal challenge for her. And, um, you know, sometimes as educators, our challenges come from the outside, but sometimes they're our own. Sometimes there are personal things, our walls, our lenses, our ideas that maybe need to be stretched and our piggy bank needs to be broken into a little bit. And I'm just wondering, Juliet, if you could talk a little bit about, um, about challenges that may have come from inside, our own, your own internal challenges that may have brought you to, to greater understanding in your, in your learning journey. Yeah, I find that what when it comes to challenges the biggest hurdle i think all of us have is mindset because my job is encouraging and supporting people to get outside and time and time again it's the same issues a slightly different context um, and so for me it's about working on mindset and confidence and how can we be brave enough to do to take those steps and one quote i, I love when, when you put this to me was um one from patrick overton and he talks and i think this is very of its moment now when we walk to the edge of all light we have and take a step into the darkness of the unknown we must believe that one of two things will happen there will be something solid for you to stand on or you will be taught how to fly. Um, and I think if people can be brave enough to remember that, that, that there are people, um, we've talked about the fact that we need each other, relationships are key as Laura says. So if you have good relationships, you've got people who are holding you up, who are there to catch you so that you do have something to fall on and they'll hoik you up and, and help you fly too. So I, I, I think that's quite something. And just yesterday, in fact, on Twitter, somebody was asking me about what books to read and this early years educator had clearly done her research and she had read some great books. And I actually put back, um, I would actually read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teenagers because really that's all about life management and it's about skills for managing uncertainty and change and that we can read all we want with vigor during this time we can actually overload with information and plans about what we're going to do when schools return but ultimately we have to manage that and most importantly remember we can only really manage and influence ourselves that's that's who we have power and control over so that's so working on that really helps um, I don't know if that's the sort of answer you were expecting, but um, hopefully it's of value to this conversation. Well, I think it's of I think it's of great value because I think um, I, I think the expectations we set for ourselves um, can 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 either limit us or or let us go free. And I think that quote is a is a perfect example of that. And um, I think that's a lesson that's that's hard to share with with others. I think that's someone who's standing on the edge there, I think it's actually quite hard for them to to see the value of that, that it's going to be all right and to go ahead and take that step. I think it's I think it's a challenging spot. And I think as educators, it's sometimes hard for us to communicate that because, um, you know, for whatever reason, especially in, in this current situation where the equity of the classroom, the, the solidity of everybody sitting in the same kind of chair, in the same kind of room, having had the same sort of meal um, is, is, we don't have that. And so, 
it, it's even more challenging, this piece of communication of giving confidence to others and, and giving them the, the freedom to take the big risk. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, does anybody on the panel have any good advice about how we might be able to really, really, you know, empower our students and our fellow faculty members in times like these when we all need to be um, free and bold to take risks? Anybody have a thought for that? I, one of the things that I found that uh, sounds all too simple but has been very helpful is to, to ask. Uh, and to create structures by which those who want to participate and those who have ideas to share uh, can do so and, and then just get out of the way because often the, the answers and the, the innovative things you'll put forth come from the most interesting places. Uh, and they're not, you know, long meetings and things like that. They're thoughts somebody had in the middle of the night and they put it on a digital whiteboard. And all of a sudden, you collect these ideas, and all you've done is ask people um, what they think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. I think also to to go ahead and be open about um, the times when you do actually have those failures. Mm -hmm. To be transparent about that, if if you're if you're a mentor or a, a collaborator, to just go ahead and say, "Hey, wow, I tried that, and that was a disaster." So. Mm -hmm. you know feel free to fail yeah Laura what were you thinking Laura McBain I, I love that quote Julie thinking about design and the unknown and navigating ambiguity I think I have I have two thoughts on this one is um, you know we are all navigating ambiguity in moments and how do we move from like enduring it embracing it and I think that we spend time particularly in this moment when we're in moments of uncertainty I think that we all strive for certainty you know and like strive onto something that can feel tactical or hard that we can actually hold on to. Um, and I think as leaders in this moment, I will say, you know, in the last couple of weeks, we haven't been able to do that. You know, we can't make decisions because the information is dynamic and shifting all the time. And I think understanding and just calling that we are in, amb in an ambiguous moment and it is uncertain and we don't know the outcome and just to call it out and say that I think is really important so that people can understand how, why I'm not giving you an answer right now because I don't have, I don't know the future and I don't know what school will look like next year. And how do we build our capacity to hold space for uncertainty and ambiguity um, and uncomfortableness or discomfort is part of, you know, I think part of this work. Um, and I think with respect to Tom's piece, I think we're around empowering. I always think about that word a lot, particularly around like um, privilege and equity is that like our students are already empowered. We just weren't actually seeing it or it didn't look the way we wanted it to look based on our vision of what power could look like. And so I often think about like, people are already empowered, are we willing to listen? And it's gonna show up differently than probably you might envision it. And so we've been spending a lot of time doing need findings with young people. Um, we went on TikTok and they're, they're, I mean, right now people are, students are face, uh, posting on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok about what they think about education right now what they think about AP testing, what they think about assessment, virtual learning. And they're doing it on a platform that's actually, that's elevating and actually is designed for their voice. They're not in a classroom. And I think about like, what can we learn from these moments where students are sharing their authentic voices, some of it's maybe not as authentic as we would like or more published, you know, um, but they're sharing their insights from this about what they think about education, whether it's like lecture-based, models or, or experiential models that they're not getting, um, the inequities, kind of the conditions at which they're working in. And I wonder about how we like broaden our sphere a little bit about what education and what power meant, what power looks like. And I think a lot of what this moment's going to reveal is like the, I think a disruption of the traditional hierarchy in education. People have, you know, are establishing themselves with like digital platforms, voices in all different spectrums. And I think there is a really beautiful, um, hap you know, disruption happening about what learning could be. And um, people that were, you know, that were working in an office are now teaching online, you know, um, and how do we really open ourselves up to like this reimagination about who is the teacher and who is the learner? and really use it as an opportunity for liberation of the system 
And so I'm just really kind of watching those indicators and what are the bright spots, right? That actually could help us really reimagine to do, I think, a lot of the stuff that everyone on this call is already doing, right? In their classrooms and in their schools. And how do we make that more accessible for others um, is the wondering that I have right now in a moment where I think the inequity is really coming up, right? Across schools, we're seeing access. So in, in access, really. Laura Thomas, talk to us about this. Yeah, you know, Laura, I've been thinking about that same thing so much lately. Um, so uh, Rob Freed wrote a book called The Game of School, um, and it's, a, it's an older book. It's not, a, it's not a new release by any means. But as we've moved into this, um, whatever, crisis pedagogy is the phrase that we're using around here right now, um, that a lot of the trappings that he wrote about in that book and that Ted Sizer wrote about um, in Horace's Compromise and Horace's School and Deb Meyer has written about, all of those trappings have fallen away. And years ago, and even today, when I do curriculum teaching in my, or my, when I teach my curriculum design class, I ask my students to think like, okay, because they'll say, well, I have 600 standards I'm supposed to teach. And I say, well, okay, let's put that aside for a moment. If you only have two weeks, what would you teach? And they spend some time on that. If I only had two weeks, what would I teach? And then I say, now that's your curriculum. Everything else, you're going to do what you do with. But the two weeks, the, the material that's so important that it's, that it's worth anything, like if you only had two weeks, you'd do that. That's the core of what you want your kids to know before they leave you. And I think that when I think about the equity piece right now, particularly, I think about the teachers that I know who are, you know, they're going above and beyond to try to figure out how to reach kids who don't have any connectivity. Um, so, and they, I even know some teachers whose schools have said flat out, we're not teaching. Like, we're just not because we don't have any way to teach everybody. So we're not going to do it, which is a kind of equity, but not a great kind of equity, I guess. And so, and so watching them all struggle with this. And when I talk about what are you struggling to get to your kids, they're not trying to get their full curriculum to their kids. Like they've fallen into just those, that, what they would put in those two weeks. Um, and I think that's the thing. The game of school has sort of fallen apart. And the question is, it's like, um, I think it's Brene Brown has been writing some lately about whatever's going to come next is going to be something that we create. We're not going to get the old normal back. And so to be really intentional and to think about it from an equity perspective and a, a perspective of privilege, who are the kids who are getting everything right now and who have the connectivity and who are going to come out of this way ahead? And how, how have we inadvertently or on purpose deepened that achievement gap, I, I don't, I feel like there are huge questions there that we're going to have to answer and we need to start working on them now because we need to be ready when we finally have whatever the new normal is going to be. Um, Cause the, we, yeah, we've, we've done great things for some kids and we've really done some damage to others. Yep. Yep. Rebecca, I can see you've got something to say there. Just briefly, I would just return to Jennifer Staple Clark for a moment because one of her convictions when she was building this remarkably now successful global health program, Unite for Sight, was that um, out of the places with gaps in healthcare, places like rural Africa could come models for innovation in the ways that we think about um, what healthcare delivery in the future should look like, and what the new, where, where the new kinds of, um, where the new kinds of ways to work or learn might be, and I think it's important for us to to remember right now. I mean, we're sitting here; it's it's the week of Earth Day, right? Like the massive global event that's pulling people together to learn and think and celebrate and and express grief across the planet about environmental damage. How is that going to happen? Well. As the parent of a teen climate activist myself, I've seen a lot of loss and a lot of sadness in the last few weeks in my household about what, how politics really works and how we're really gonna tackle these problems or not with the next generation in mind. And I've also seen a lot of pivoting by these adolescents we're talking about, by teenagers, by, um, and I've seen pivoting by all kinds of actors who are overnight educators, not just because they have kids at home, but journalists and developers and people who are suddenly turning to the task, 
my Earth Day Live experiences have involved partners, including journalists and developers from London and Washington DC, Kenya, Nairobi, and there's no one size fits all. I mean, it's certainly true that for our platform, when we began developing our products and we wanted to run our modules in Ghana, we were smacked in the face by the fact that their Wi-Fi access simply wouldn't allow them to, to, to use our platform the way we designed it. And we had to get more information about what kind of cell phones students had because they don't have computers. And we had to get more, we had to build in features so they could download the case and then run it offline without a Wi-Fi connection. Those affordances to students without as much access have made our platform more intuitive, more responsive, even for the high-end learners who are constantly on high, you know, like my own teenager likes being able to do a module on her cell phone sometimes. And so I think that this idea that, you know, resolving the equity challenges could be something we have to slow down and take into account is important, but it may also be that it helps us leapfrog or design better to be engaged in these ways. Our Earth Day Live events are gonna be, you know, airing content on Kenyan TV for students who cannot get the streaming so that they can then use their cell phone to join us for the live discussion with many different professionals and think about future careers for themselves. These are the kinds of things that this week with the global concern about the environment and the new overnight educator trends are kind of making possible. And so I wanna just lodge a little bit of real optimism and excitement about that, even as these cautionary tales are so important for us to really talk about. That's so true. And I think also, I, I mean, I think what we recognize here is that um, some of the inequity is the educator. For us, some some of the inequity. I mean, what what we may discover is what we think is better is not better. Um, I think Juliet could probably talk to the idea that you know we could build big, beautiful schools with tons and tons of computers and never send our kids outside again. And some people might say, "Hey, that's innovation," but it's not. It's it's robbing them of something that's critically important. And so I think in times like these, where I feel like we're really moving ahead quite quickly, and technology is getting, you know, it, it we're empowering technology actually. Um, I'm just wondering what words of wisdom you could offer the world, Juliet, to keep us um, in our messy mess, in our in our in our mud pies, and and staying outside and learning the 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 global lessons of just being by a tree um, or a plant, if that's all you have. Yeah, well, I think this has been touched upon without reference to outdoors or the natural world, because um, I, I can't remember who it was, but was talking about um, the importance of connectivity in terms of children being able to connect with each other. Um, and I think there is a, a good argument for we need to become connected to place, to the land, to nature, however you wish to define that. But but that's where that's ultimately that's where we genetically belong, you know, with our bare feet walking the ground and feeling. And it may be unpleasant when we walk over some surfaces, but funnily enough, our feet adapt. And our barefoot walkers have great big soles on their feet that will will take them anywhere. So, so I think I think there is a lot about um, being outside that helps us to connect. My experience is it um, because you have released control much more to children when you step outside because they see the schoolyard as theirs. So, and in fact, I've even had children ask me. If we go off site, surely you're not in charge of us anymore, miss, because we're not at school. You know, so again, really interesting. Um, we shift the balance of power outside. And I think the other thing we have to remember too, and we've shifted the balance of power, we've passed it over now, and we're having to trust parents and trust children, but it's the same outside. So inside, you have set up your classroom to the nth degree, down to where the pencils sit and why, where the erasers are, and how we even sharpen the pencils in the classroom. Whereas outside, suddenly, that doesn't matter so much. You know, you take, you take pencils that don't need sharpened, or you have a knife with you, a pen knife, you know, that can actually do the job quickly. So you become much more adaptable 
and that's what I see with educators is that they become empowered when they learn that going outside isn't big and scary, that, that actually this really boosts their confidence. And we are seeing now from our Dundee city work that, that we're, we're plotting self-reported between child and adult together. They give a shared um, feedback that um, they are more engaged and they do achieve better when working outside. But funnily enough, when they come back inside, the grades and the confidence continue to rise as well. And maybe that's what we could look for from this. We've relinquished the power. Now let's ask the parents and let's ask our children, you know, how do we need to change what we're now doing back in the classroom to acknowledge this amazing experience you've had um, and for, for, for many, for not all, and we've got to remember those who will have suffered in silence through this time as well, but the lessons learned and use them as strengths to, to, to make actually a better world, as Rebecca says, because that's ultimately what this is about too. You know, it's a climate emergency and these changes have to help us deal with that. Because if we think this is bad, we need to be thinking considerably more adaptively into the near future. Wow, yes, yes. Um, uh, amen. I'm, I'm a little bit speechless, yes, amen, agreed, agreed. Um, so we've, we've discussed a lot of I, things that I, I've found ex extremely insightful and, and valuable. I'm, I'm so grateful for all of your words. Um, but I just wonder if we could quickly go around the group and just, um, if you just had a, had, had a, a very short encouragement um, to the people who are listening about how they might go off to use this, this information that they've heard today in a, in a really positive and authentic way. If you just had one little offering of advice and I'll just kind of go around the group, if that's okay. Tom, what, what would you say to our listeners today? All the people that are with us on Zoom. I think of all the conferences that I and many others have, have attended over the course of our career. And I always try to apply the same theme. If, if I can come out of whatever time that is with one or two nuggets and turn that into something practical that helps me and my uh, in my school, um, then you accumulate a lot of nuggets over time. Uh, so I, I think there's something for everybody and just grab onto it and go with it. Great, great. Laura Thomas, what would you say, say to all of our friends here? Um, I would say that um, even though we're socially distancing, that doesn't mean that we're socially isolating. Um, so find people that, um, that lift you up and connect to them however you can, um, you know, by email, by phone, um, by Zoom, whatever it is, um, and check in frequently, both professionally and personally, um, because we're gonna get through this, but we're gonna get through it together. Um, and so find your people and hold on to them, Great. even if you can't actually touch them. <laughs> yes, please don't touch them. <laughs> Laura McBain, what would you, what would you say? Yeah, I think a lot about this quote that we have at the D School, which is like, to be a designer is to be a steward of possibility. We search for the outcomes that do not exist. And in doing so, we dive into, dive into the deep of the unexpected and the unknown. And um, to be a designer is not just to like design a massive program and to like get it all out. It's to actually just find that one little thing, as Tom said, the nugget and start. We like a bias reduction. So for anyone listening, you don't have to have the entire virtual class planned out. You just have to think about how do I get my students to stand up for 10 minutes or 10 seconds as the introduction to the class, you know, or how do you do the smallest thing possible to help you learn the most. And I think it's really starting small, finding a real small thing you can try and learning from that, not trying to figure it all out, but just taking one small step and thinking about how did it go? What did I learn? And what might I do uh, the next time? Great. Juliet? I'm going to build on what Laura has said then. And I'm going to say, remember that passion creates possibility. And if you find your passion and use it as a positive tool for learning and change for the best, then you will contribute to this world in, in a really good, positive way. Beautiful. Rebecca? 
Yeah, I I want to come back to that image of of standing on the the rim of a of a sort of dark and un, and mysterious challenge that Juliet offered us earlier. It was a lovely image, very evocative. I think, and I I also want to remind us that she's right. This dark edge is nothing compared to the ones that lie ahead of us at the rate we're going. So we are doing calisthenics right now in terms of a politics of hope, of that collaboration of those who hold you up, as she said, who teach you to fly. I agree completely with what my fellow panelists have said. And as always, I feel like these curated conversations bring together voices that don't always get to rub up against each other and sparks do fly. I feel so inspired when I leave these conversations and I feel so confident that um, in fact, um, you know, this, this is an example of the ways in which we find new hands to hold us up as we go. Um, and the ways in which they will be there, you know, through the doubt and uncertainty and through the idea that something's a triumph and then turns out not to be such a big one. I think those, those ups and downs are going to be where we are for a while. But I, I do really very much believe that these calisthenics are making us stronger as, as humanity for facing what's ahead and for facing and for pulling what's within us out into relationships to each other. And yes, Julie, as you say, to the world around us. That's where those energies come from in so many ways is the, the earth we walk on, the things we see, the light we bathe in on a sunny day, um, the wind we feel in our faces. And so I wanna thank Slate School and I wanna thank my fellow panelists for somehow managing to weave together that place-based knowledge and that you know collaborative energy with our individual flights of insight and inspiration. And I really look forward to our next conversations in the Education Idea Lab. Same here. I always say to my students, and I'm putting my money where my mouth is now, I say, school is wherever you are. If you're on a school bus, school is the school bus. If you're at home, school is home. We're always learning all the time. And if you think you're not, you're wrong. It's the only time you'll definitely be wrong because we're always learning. School is wherever you are. So this concludes the time we have for this panel. I can't believe it, it's flown by. I wanna thank all of our amazing panelists for the generous sharing of your wisdom. Um, I learned so much today. I'm so grateful, thank you so much. And I'm sure that everyone who tuned in from all around the world did as well. So, so long from Slate School. And as I say at the end of every class meeting, positive rice to all of you, positive rice. And thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much.